Hello and welcome to We Are Biostimulant, the official podcast of Biostimulant.com, where we talk about all things biostimulant with interesting people from around the globe. I'm Monica. What better way to launch our first podcast than with the recognized authority on plant biostimulants? Today, we are joined by Professor Patrick Dujardin of the Jean Bleu Agrobiotech Research Unit of the University of Liege in Belgium. Professor Dujardin is a senior scientist and an expert in plant physiology and nutrition. His current research is focused on the action of microbial and non-microbial biostimulants on crop plants, and he'll be sharing with us his thoughts on the state of biostimulants, their use and value, and what he sees for the future. So please stay with us. We've got some great information to share. Professor Jardin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, as you know, Professor, um, this is our first podcast, uh, so we'll be starting with the basics. But before we do, I think it would be great to learn a little bit more about you. You are a leading authority on the subject of biostimulants. In fact, as I read your bio, you had provided a couple of reports back in 2012 and 2014 that helped lay the groundwork for the European Commission's regulatory framework for the use of biostimulants. We'd love to have you tell us a little bit more about your history and research and how you became so involved in biostimulants early on. Well, in fact, I was working on biostimulants uh, without knowing that they were biostimulants uh, because the, the word was not that popular in the scientific uh, world. Uh, so that was in, in, the, uh, uh, in the years 2000. For, for me, I was working on bacteria, interacting with plants, showing some positive effect on root development in plants. And um, I, I was uh, in contact with some people of the European Commission at that time, and, and they asked me to, um, to help them better understand uh, the scientific grounds of uh, these biostimulants that were proposed by the industry. The industry was explaining to the Commission that we have new products uh, helping the plants grow better, um, making better products, and uh, but that, that the legislative framework was not appropriate for these new categories of products. And so uh, I was asked to uh, issue a scientific report on the um, scientific literature about biostimulants, about what we know, what we knew at that time, and um, from this information to try to define uh, biostimulants and to see how uh, they were overlapping or not overlapping with um, fertilizers in the regulation, with plant protection products as uh, regulated in, in Europe. So that was in fact the starting point of my uh, interactions with uh, both the regulator, the European Commission, but also with the industry. And um, I then realized, uh, looking to the scientific literature on these biostimulants, that in fact there were many substances and microorganisms that were able to interact with the plant, with the functioning, the physiology of the plant, and that uh, there were really interesting things to to uh, to, um, to 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 use and to exploit uh, from an agricultural point of view. You mentioned the fact that biostimulants were affecting the physiological functions of the plants, mm -hmm. um, and you realized the difference between fertilizers and other inputs early on. And uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Yes, this is indeed very important to understand. Yes, yes, indeed. They were first defined as not being fertilizers and not being plant protection products uh, because they are not fertilizers because uh, their function is not to provide nutrients because that's the way fertilizers are defined. They are suppliers of nutrients. They are not plant protection products because the primary function is not to protect plants from uh, pathogens and pests, but still they do have a beneficial effect. And the, the reason for that is that they interact with uh, physiological functions, uh, resulting in uh, improved development of roots, for instance. 
they modify the capacity of the roots to use the nutrients, they uh, interact with the production of antioxidants in the plants, explaining that they help the plant uh, cope with environmental stresses like drought or salinity. They can also uh, interplay with the um, metabolism of the plant, resulting in changes in composition of uh, secondary metabolites, which can be important for uh, the, the nutritional quality or the, uh, the industrial qualities of different products. So they have physiological targets in the plants, resulting in some beneficial effects. Uh, I, I would maybe use an analogy with human nutrition. When when you, uh, you, 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 you take different uh, products in, in your uh, diets, it's not only to have uh, fuels and uh, energy and carbon, but it, it's also to promote some uh, physiological functions of your body, like you want to increase the antioxidant uh, response, you have to don't regulate in inflammatory uh, reactions of, of the plant. And so um, basically, uh, I, I would say that plant uh, biostimulants are some kinds of functional ingredients of, uh, of fertilizing products. So they are applied to the plant together with fertilizers, but because they will target specific functions, physiological functions of the plant, helping the plant better grow, helping the plant uh, better use the resources of the environment, uh, helping the plant cope with uh, different kinds of stress. And this is quite new. This is really uh, uh, something that was not um, in mind when uh, the, the first agricultural uh, inputs were proposed to farmers, uh, because the two main objectives were either to, uh, to, to feed the plants uh, with fertilizers or to protect the plants against uh, pathogens and pests, but providing the farmer with the capacity to modulate specific physiological functions of, of the plants is something really new and interesting. Excellent. And now you mentioned the various physiological functions that biostimulants can affect. Are there specific categories or different types of biostimulants that affect the various uh, physiological functions? No, I think it's difficult to, to assign specific functions to specific categories of biostimulants because each category uh, is able to modulate many functions. Within each category, you will have to discriminate between uh, different types, like if you look, for instance, to seaweed extracts, or humic acids, which are classical examples of uh, and, class and main categories of biostimulants, you can have different effects depending on the way you have prepared the product, the, the source of the product, the way uh, it was formulated, uh, the way it is applied to the plant, whether you have foliar application or soil application or seed coating. Uh, so there are really different ways of applying the products. Uh, different kinds of products. So that's a difficulty with uh, plant biostimulants. It's that it's very difficult to generalize uh, either their uses or their functions. That's a challenge, but that's also maybe an opportunity because that means that you, you, you should be able at the end to propose a product uh, to the farmer which will be really um, targeted to specific functions, to, to targeted uh, effects on, on, on the plants. And um, this is also a challenge, of course, for the industry uh, to, to be able to propose such product with a very clear function and with a very reproducible, robust uh, function uh, to be proposed to, to the farmer. But still, uh, we have to say that um, it's important to, to refer also to the uh, European, the new European regulation, uh, which describes uh, what types of effects are targeted, uh, the main categories of effects, I would say, which are defined as claims. These are the, that's the word used by the regulation. Mm -hmm. So biostimulants are defined by intended effects, which are the claims. The first one is increased nutrient use efficiency. The second one is uh, improved tolerance to abiotic stress. 
the third one is improved uh, quality of the products. And the fourth is um, the, uh, the uh, increased availability of nutrients which are confined in the soil or in the rhizosphere. So that means that nutrients which are present in the soil but which are not available to the plant. And biostimulants should help make these uh, nutrients available to plants. So when you, 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 you place on the market a biostimulant, when you communicate to the farmer, you have to be clear about which claim is indeed targeted, or there can be more of one uh, targeted by, by the product. But this is a reference uh, for both the, the industry, for the, for the farmers. Uh, the effects should be clearly defined and the conditions of replication should also be clearly defined in a way that the, the farmer knows what type of effect can be achieved in, in which uh, condition. Now, understanding that the these are the claims, and you know what is happening in Europe. Uh, for example, I'm I'm speaking to you from the United States, and we are a couple of years behind uh, what Europe has been doing in their regulatory process of the use of biostimulants. Do you see um, what else is happening in other regions of the world, um, and if there's you know other countries that are kind of following? The, the same path? Yes, yes, definitely yes. Uh, first, in, in the recognition that we, 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 are, we, we do have new categories of products which allow us to intervene on uh, crop productions in ways which are different than what we have done so far. So we have new opportunities. There is a general acknowledgement of this, um, including by the regulations. And the second uh, main thing is that biostimulants are uh, identified by those claims that we talked about. So, and we have uh, a clear um, uh, adoption of the claims as defined by uh, the European regulation in other texts, uh, regulatory texts, including in the in the in the US. Um, um, so I think it's it's important to know that we have no new categories of products that will be defined by claims and that um, to communicate in a fair way to, to, to the farmer, we need to, to clearly um, substantiate uh, the claims. That means the effectiveness of the, of, of the products with respect to these claims. According to those claims, it's pretty clear that the farmer can see some real economical value or value in his, his yield, his growth, his quality uh, against those claims. Can the consumer benefit from the use of biostimulants? Can a consumer help drive the demand for the use of biostimulants, similar to the way the consumer has driven the demand for organically grown? I think, in fact, both are related. Uh, the, the demand for organic products and, and demand for biostimulants could be uh, convergent, in fact, because um, we have to acknowledge that biostimulants are a way to promote uh, what I would call a more sustainable agriculture, which, mean, which means uh, a better um, use of the resources of the environment, uh, better use of the applied fertilizers as well. For instance, if you want to reduce the amount of inorganic fertilizers applied to the plant, and this is needed if you want to reduce the uh, adverse effects of these fertilizers applied, like greenhouse gas emissions, uh, contamination of water by nitrates and phosphates, etc. If you want to address these problems, you need to make the plant more efficient in the way it uses the resources of its environment. And um, clearly, this is one major expected consequence of the adoption of biostimulants. Plants will use fertilizers in a more efficient way, which means that the farmer will have the capacity to reduce the rates of application of these fertilizers and this will result in, 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 in a better uh, environment, in a more sustainable uh, agriculture. We have said that the uh, biostimulants will help the plant better resist stress conditions. Uh, this is mostly uh, about uh, concerning the uh, abiotic stress. 
but uh, a more vigorous plant, a plant uh, which uh, better uses the uh, nutrients of its environment, uh, clearly will also um, resist better uh, the um, pathogen and disease uh, attacks of, of, of the, uh, from the environment. So uh, the aim is of biostimulants is certainly not to uh, protect the plant against diseases, uh, allowing to reduce the, um, the, the, the the plant protection products. But um, I think it is correct to say that it will be a secondary consequence of the use of plant biostimulants. And so for that reason as well, um, I think there is an interest in, in clearly in the, in the plant biostimulants. The quality of the products, I think that more and more people are concerned about quality of products in terms of uh, mineral contents, uh, antioxidant uh, contents like phenolics, etc. And this is also uh, one of the um, reasons why uh, plant based stimulants are used, because they are able to, uh, to modulate the metabolism of the plant and to to improve the nutrient contents of the, the plant products that are proposed to consumers. So at least this is one avenue for, for the future. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, now, coming up uh, very soon in uh, November of 2019, uh, you will be the chairman of the scientific committee at the 4th Biostimulant World Congress in Barcelona. In your message to the constituents, you speak about the growth we have seen in the biostimulant segment and the fact that growers have also been able to see value. Mm -hmm. One thing you point out is that there is a need to learn more about the mode of action for the various biostimulants we have available to us. Can you tell us more about what you mean by that? Yes, it's 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 really uh, still a difficulty to to well understand how these biostimulants work uh, because um, in some cases we have to admit uh, that the farmer does not see uh, the effect when a plant biostimulant is applied, and it's not always. In many cases, in fact, it is not easy to explain why it does work in some conditions and why it does not work in in other conditions. But one reason for that is that uh, it's because we don't understand exactly how the product works, how it interferes with physiological functions, and how we should precisely apply the product. I will give you an example. You have um, different plant biostimulants improving the tolerance of plants uh, to a drought conditions. But for some plant biostimulants, it's important to, to apply the, the product before stress application because um, the, the way this biostimulants works is to, to prepare the plant, to, to, to prime the plant for, for coping in a better way with the drought conditions. So it, it's, it's a way to prepare the plant. Other plant biostimulants will help not uh, in the preparation of the plant before stress, but in the recovery of the plant after stress. Uh, so uh, you can understand from this example that if you want to have a beneficial effect on drought tolerance by the use of the biostimulants, in the first case, it is really critical to apply the plant biostimulants before the stress episode. In the second case, it will be important and sufficient to apply the product uh, just after the, the, the stress episode. If you don't know this kind of information, if you don't know enough about the action mechanisms of the biostimulants, that means that you will not know exactly when to apply the product to reap the benefits of, of, of the application. And that's just an example to... to to show you uh, how much uh, research is still needed to improve the knowledge on the action mechanisms, because this is really needed uh, to make the product really reliable for, for the farmer. And another way, uh, another um, way to define the action mechanism is to, to better define the, um, the bioactive substances which are really responsible for the effects uh, because when you talk about seaweed extracts, for instance, or protein hydrolysates, uh, which are main categories of plant biostimulants, in fact, it's, uh, it's uh, a combination of so many compounds uh, 
uh, that it's difficult to precisely identify which are those compounds really responsible for the bioactivity. And if you know which are these compounds, then it's possible to optimize the product as supplied to the farmer. It's possible to optimize the uh, manufacturing process in a way that you can um, fully guarantee the presence and quality of those uh, uh, bioactive compounds in, in the product. When you will know enough, when you know enough about the composition of the product and the bioactive fractions of the products, of course, it's, it helps a lot to uh, place on the market uh, very efficient products. It sounds as though we've come quite a long way over the, the number of years with the research, but there's still plenty to still understand so that the, the growers are able to uh, most efficiently utilize their resources in their growth. One other um, item that you spoke about in your message um, was the convergence of technologies. What are some of those opportunities that we're looking forward to? Yes, well, I think that we have um, I, I, I would mention as essentially two types of conversions. One is about um, one refers to this claim of improved nutrient use efficiency. Uh, that means that you will aim at combining the right plant biostimulants with the right fertilizer at the right uh, developmental stage of the plant. And uh, it means that in some cases uh, you might be interested in uh, really helping young plants, young seedlings to develop and use the uh, uh, available nutrients at critical stages of the development. Um, and in that case, it might be very appropriate to um, design a seed coating technologies where you will include humic acids, for instance, which will promote early uh, root development of the seedling, allowing the seedling to better use the phosphate at that time of the, the, the crop. Uh, so I think that if you, if you identify a, a, a precise uh, agricultural agronomic uh, target, you know that your, your seedling needs this type of nutrient at that developmental stage, then you can combine different technologies in a way that you, you really um, enhance uh, the, um, the value of the, the biostimulant. Uh, the, the other example is what we already mentioned about the stress conditions like drought conditions. One, one bottleneck today is that it's difficult for us to follow the, the stress experienced by the plant during the, 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 the crop season. And, but uh, there are significant progress made using the uh, precision agriculture technologies, remote sensing technologies, allowing us to monitor the stress conditions experienced by the crop. And if you are able to better define these stress conditions, uh, then of course uh, it helps a lot to decide when to apply the product on the plant, uh, before the stress, during the stress, after the stress, as we mentioned. And that means that we really do need this convergence of technologies to make uh, all technologies really useful to, to the farmer. I see. Are we facing some regulatory challenges uh, going forward? Oh yes, we do have uh, regulatory challenges indeed. Um, I think the main challenge today in Europe, at least, and but I think that uh, we can we 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 can say uh, the same about other regions of of the world. Market a product based on a claim. Uh, we need to be able to support the claim with uh, data. And we need to, to be able to validate this data. Um, and that means that we have to agree on how to validate the data. I mean that if you, if you place a product on the market uh, with the claim of improving the tolerance to abiotic stress, to, to drought stress, how can you really support this claim? Uh, there will be, in, at least in Europe, the claim will be indicated on the label. So it's fair to, uh, to, to substantiate this claim by um, data uh, provided by the, the industry. But for that, uh, we have to agree on the, the methods and the protocols that can be used to produce this data, to validate the data. 
So that means that there is a all work now of standardization of procedures, protocols, methods, allowing the industry to, uh, to produce the data, uh, which will indeed be uh, considered as sufficient to uh, support the claims. Uh, so this is today the state of the art, I would say, of the regulation in Europe. So we have a new text, we have categories defined, we have uh, definitions, but we know that for implementing this regulation, we need these uh, standards. We need to, to provide all actors, uh, industry, regulators, uh, farmers, uh, certification bodies, uh, with clear rules about how to validate the claims. And the, the questions, the scientific and technical questions are very, very difficult, in fact. And uh, it will be difficult to, uh, to have a, um, a system which will be fully sufficient for accommodating all substances proposed as uh, biostimulants, all effects which are proposed for these biostimulants or the different claims. So there is still a long way, but I think we are on the right track. In the future, what, 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 what does the future hold? for biostimulants as you see it? Well, I think that um, we do have opportunities which will really drive the development of, um, of biostimulants, things we can do today and which we, we could not do before, like, okay, how to protect the plant against abiotic stress. This is something that, for which we had very few answers uh, until uh, biostimulants. No, we have products that you can apply to plants and okay, that, that, that will help plants better withstand a stressful situations. So that, that's quite new. So that, that's a major driver. But we still have um, many limitations. And I think that one difficulty is also to better understand which are the plant traits that we need to modify if you want to improve stress and tolerance, what really makes a plant uh, tolerant to stress? So these are basic questions of plant physiology, but we really need now to, uh, to address them because we have capacities to, to modulate different traits of the plant, but which are those really important for improving uh, yield under stress uh, situation. And so, uh, again, we need a combination of tools. Uh, we need uh, advanced research. Uh, we need to, to, to be able to, to bridge academic research with industrial research. Um, this is really needed to drive uh, the development of, um, of biostimulants. But I think that uh, we have really also, also main drivers from the uh, economic sector. We talked about sustainability. Uh, circular economy is clearly a driver for the development of biostimulants because we, we produce, the industry produces uh, biostimulants by using different uh, industrial uh, byproducts. So it's also a way to, to promote circular economy. Uh, we, we can have new uh, fertilizing products, improving the nutrition of the plants, obtained from different types of materials and byproducts. Um, these are all drivers which will be um, important for the future of biostimulants, definitely. Excellent. Um, well, all the important work that you're doing is certainly very much appreciated, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to, to help us uh, learn a little bit more about biostimulants. Mm -hmm. Professor, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening. I hope you found Professor Dujardin as interesting and insightful as I did. To learn more about biostimulants, we invite you to visit biostimulant.com. And of course, if you like what you heard, we invite you to see all our podcast episodes on that website or look for us on Apple, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. Once again, I'm Monica, and thank you for listening.